Mr. Foles. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, yes. counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are privileged, our team, to represent Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, who's sitting over here. And we're here because of a tragedy, there's no doubt. There was a tragic uh, occurrence on that movie set. But let me tell you something you already know. Just because there was a tragedy does not mean that a crime was committed. It does not mean that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed caused the crimes they have charged her with. And we are going to, through the course of this case, show you that production and the state very, uh, have both, very early on, sought to make Hannah Gutierrez-Reed a scapegoat. That's what this is about. You're going to hear that this tragedy, several unconnected events, independent events had to happen to create it. First, the first event that had to happen is the actor, Alec Baldwin, pointed a gun on that set and he either had his finger on the trigger and the hammer cocked or he pulled the trigger as he was pointing that at Miss Hutchins and Mr. Souza, who was right behind her. And make no mistake, this is not a prop gun. This is a real gun. Mr. Baldwin pointed it right at him either had his finger on the trigger and depressed or pulled it, causing that gun to fire and hit Miss Hutchins. That's the first thing that had to happen. Miss Gutierrez-Reed, you're not going to hear anything about her being in that church or firing that weapon. That was Alec Baldwin. You will hear that Hollywood actors are not allowed to point guns, real guns, at other actors or crew. It's, a, it's like every other uh, safety with guns in any other place in society. You learn these rules and go into the classes. You learn these rules if you've ever owned a gun. Rule number one, never point a firearm at somebody unless you intend to shoot them. And that rule was broken. And that's going to be the first thing you're going to hear that, that caused this tragic accident. The second thing is that Hannah is being made a scapegoat for are deliberate errors and mistakes by production. So the opening counsel for the state talked about Ms. Gutierrez-Reed and tried to put all of the onus on her. At the time, she was 24 years old. She had been hired for two duties, a props assistant, and you're going to hear what that is, and the armorer role, two different duties. So they were splitting her between those and making her, for example, roll cowboy cigarettes that was one of them for the movie, and they had props that the actors have. And so she was having to do that to take away from her armor duties. You're going to hear about that. Now, OSHA is a New Mexico agency, and that New Mexico agency inspected the movie and investigated this shooting, after the shooting. You're going to hear that OSHA found fault with production. They found numerous faults, numerous mistakes on production's part, not Ms. Gutierrez-Reed on production. You're going to hear that OSHA indicated that there was a rush set, that there were several safety errors, and I'm going to talk about those in a moment, but I want to make that very clear. When the state talks about Ms. Gutierrez-Reed being negligent, what really happened is production was negligent. Production put her in that position. They put her in the position of having two jobs, a props assistant and an armorer, and expected a 24-year-old under really tough conditions to keep up with everything that was going on. And you're going to hear about that. You're going to hear that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed emailed the production manager, Gabrielle Pickle, who's on this set. You're going to hear Gabrielle Pickle. And she asked her for more armorer days. She said... In this email, when I'm not able to focus on my armor duties, this is when mistakes happen. And she was, she was telling her this. Now, Miss Pickle came back and said, no, we only have eight armor days, and that's all you're going to get. So out of the whole course of the movie, they didn't allow her to be an armorer and to perform those duties to the extent that she had to. And that's going to be a very important point, too. They, they moved her between two different things, props assistant and armor. 
counsel for the state in his opening said that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed had the job of sourcing the ammo and sourcing the firearms on set. Now you're going to hear when you go through this about another name, and her name is Sarah Zachary. Sarah Zachary was the props head. So as the head of props department, she was Ms. Gutierrez-Reed's boss. In that role, Sarah Zachary had to source the ammunition and had to source the firearms. So that was not correct, what, what counsel stated in, in the opening. In reality, that was Sarah Zachary's job. Now you're going to hear that what happened is those two worked together in conjunction. Hannah was, uh, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed was supposed to be doing armor, and then she was supposed to run over and help Sarah Zachary whenever she wanted the help on props. So a lot of what you're going to hear is a chaotic scene created by production and forcing somebody to do these two different roles. You're going to hear witnesses in this case, including professional armor that the state has hired and other people that will tell you it's completely inadvisable and a terrible decision on a movie like this with so many guns that you have a part-time armor. It just is not a good idea. And that's a, a terrible idea, but that's what they did. Now, as counsel stated, you, you will hear that this scene in the church was a blocking. It was a getting ready for a rehearsal. So you're going to hear that um, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed had brought the gun to Mr. Halls, that Mr. Halls uh, never should have handled that weapon. And you're going to see he had a lot of experience in movies. He knew better. He had the weapon. He did not uh, inspect that fully. And you're going to see that Mr. Baldwin didn't inspect it at all. So when counsel showed you that video on the first part of it, when he's sitting in that pew and doing that cross draw, you're going to hear about that. You're going to hear how dangerous a seated cross draw is. It's one of the more dangerous draws you can do because you're pulling the weapon across your body and you can also pull it across other people. So you're going to hear that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed specifically requested to train Mr. Baldwin in a cross draw. And you're also going to hear that he did not do that training. He did not set that training up. So when this tragic shooting occurred, it was in the very motion of a cross draw. You're also going to hear that this scene, this blocking, didn't even, recall, didn't even require him to draw that weapon. So it's just going to be an extreme close-up scene of his hand pulling out of his holster. And they were going to focus on that, create tension in the scene in the movie. And instead, for whatever reason, Mr. Baldwin pulled it out, and it ends up being pointed right at Miss Hutchins, the camera, uh, and Mr. Souza. You're also going to hear, we're going to talk about in the course of this case, there's Hollywood tricks. These guns should never be pointed at another person that instead what should happen is there's camera tricks that you can use to make it look like it's pointed, but it's not. There's also things we're going to talk about that, that Mr. Baldwin did at that moment that he violated and safety rules. Our gun and ammunition expert, Mr. Kuski, who you're going to hear from, is going to discuss safe gun handling and usage and go through safety bulletins. These safety bulletins apply on this set to movie actors, and he's going to talk about that. Second, let me talk about the live rounds. Now, the government has a, the state has a relatively new theory, which is based totally on pictures. And you saw some of those pictures. And it's also based on the idea that live rounds have a silver primer on this set. So that's going to be the core of their argument and their theory. And you saw in the picture, one of them had a silver primer. And the primer is just that circle in the middle of the round on the back where the hammer hits, and that's what caused the round to fire. Now, what, what you didn't hear in State's opening was that there's going to be numerous dummy rounds that also have silver primers that were on this set. There was a FBI report you're going to see that a box removed from the prop truck had 16 silver primer dummies and one silver primer suspected live round. So this was a box found in the prop truck. 
So the theory that all the sober primer rounds are live is not correct. It's just not true. So you're going to hear during the course of this evidence, because of these sober primer dummies, that theory does not work. Second, you're going to hear that Rust Production ordered all the dummies on set. Rust Production sourced these primarily from a man named Seth Kinney. Seth Kinney owned PDQ Props. PDQ Props was the primary supplier to the Rust set. Now you're going to hear that that after the shooting, Seth Kenny was extremely active in contacting the sheriffs and trying to work with them and trying to point the finger away from himself. And you're going to hear about that. You're also going to hear that Sarah Zachary, who I told you about earlier, after the shooting, she sent a text to Seth Kenny, and it said emergency. Now, Sarah Zachary works for Seth Kenny and PDQ Props. She worked on set, but she was under him. She sent a text to Seth Kenny saying emergency. You're then going to hear that they had a phone call very shortly after. This is just minutes after the shooting. Sarah and Seth are talking on the phone. Now, we don't have that actual phone call, but whatever was said, Here's what happened very, the very next thing. Sarah Zachary goes over and removes rounds from two of the weapons, two of the actor's guns, and she throws them away. Now, that's absolute and complete scene tampering. And when she first was interviewed by the sheriff, Sarah Zachary said, I was panicked, and that's all I can tell you. Now, I expect in the course of this case, you're going to hear that when she was interviewed, she's going to say something like, I threw them away because that's what we do after scenes. And you're going to get to evaluate her credibility and determine why would these be thrown away they're, if they're dummy rounds, they're rounds that can be reused, they cost money. It doesn't make sense, you would just throw them away. And what was the real reason Sarah Zachary threw those rounds away right after her call with Seth Kenny. Now you're also going to hear that right after the shooting, Sarah Zachary went over and she shook some rounds and determined that they didn't shake, meaning she felt like they were live rounds. So then she throws these away. Now they're thrown in trash. She tells law enforcement, but they, on that day, they don't find them. Uh, but they're on a, they, she threw them in trash right by the prop truck, you're going to hear, but they didn't find them. So we don't have those rounds. And you're not going to be able to hear this in the course of this case or see them, see what Sarah Zachary threw away. You're not going to be able to have that because they were never recovered. That's scene tampering. You're also going to hear another instance of scene tampering, um, that Sarah Zachary carried items from the prop cart and I'll tell you a little bit more about that prop cart. Right after the shooting, she carried items to the prop truck. So she moved items from the cart, knowing there had been a shooting, knowing law enforcement's going to be here, to the prop truck. So the other problem with the state's theory now, and showing you that picture of those boxes and Benavita's truck and how they were kept on the seat, is that we don't know what was taken from the cart completely. What we do know is that one box, Seth Kenny's box, appeared and was found in the prop truck. And we know that Sarah Zachary transported items from the prop cart to the prop truck. We know that. But we're never going to know exactly what was on that cart at the time of the shooting because it was tampered with. We're also not going to know, because you're going to see on, on Officer Benavides' lapel video, that right after the shooting, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed was taken into his vehicle and segregated. She was segregated from all the other witnesses. She's sitting in his vehicle. Uh, Ms., uh, Officer Benavides, feels, Deputy Benavides, feels like he has to stay with Ms. Gutierrez-Reed because she's distraught. So he tells another person to go get the prop cart 
The prop cart is over by the church. He tells somebody else to walk over and get it. Now, I think he's going to acknowledge that he should have gone, gone and got that prop cart. Problem with that is this is just a random, uh, this is not a law enforcement, not random, we know who it is, but this is law enforcement's job to secure the scene. After a shooting like this, you don't want evidence to go walking away. You don't want it to go missing. You don't want it because we're here on a reasonable doubt standard. That standard is the highest standard under our, under our law. That means you can't convict somebody in this country, no matter who they are, unless you prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And what we've got here is theories based on evidence that has already been tampered with. And you're going to hear that in this case. That's not even going to be questioned. So you're going to have to take the leap that whatever Sarah took to the prop trip, we don't know. And whatever she did with those rounds, we don't know. And you may not know why. But I can tell you, it occurred right after the call with Seth Kenny. And you're going to hear about that. You're going to hear about his contacts with, with a uh, witness named Del Reed. Del Reed is the father of Miss Gutierrez Reed. Del Reed is one of the most renowned armorers in the history of movies. You're going to hear that he's been doing this for over 50 years. He's trained Brad Pitt, Sharon Stone, Denzel Washington. He did Tombstone. Some of you might have seen that. He did 310 to Yuma. He's the real deal. And you're going to hear that he trained Miss Gutierrez Reed. She did very well trained. She also went to film school and she completed a bachelor's degree in that. So you're going to see that she was trained, she was educated, and she was ready for this job. Now it was her her second job as head armor. You're going to hear that she had had one prior and then she had also worked as an assistant on another movie. But you're going to hear that from the time she was a little girl, her dad, Del Reed, had her on these movie sets and he was training her. Now Thel, the reason why I mention him is, is he and Seth Kinney right before Russ started, we're on another movie set called Yellowstone 1883, and that occurred in Texas. You're gonna hear that Fell Reed brought live rounds, these were 45 Colt live rounds, to Texas, and he and Seth Kinney were gonna train the actors on a, on a range, not on the set, but on a range. So they sometimes train these actors to fire the weapon and see how the recoil is and kind of get a feel for it for the, the, the movie scene. So he brought these lab rounds, they did the training, they did Yellowstone 83, and then Seth Kinney kept these lab rounds in an ammo can. He did not give them back to Thel Reed. And again, you're gonna see these were 45 Colt live rounds. Fast forward, wasn't that much longer, within months, that we have rest set. And Seth Kinney, is the primary supplier of ammunition to the rest set. You're going to see evidence in this case that Seth Kenny's rounds in a box that the sheriffs found uh, were blue. They were a certain color. And, and we'll remind you, as, as we go through, we'll highlight that, but they were a certain color. And you're going to see, for example, on the picture that the state showed you in their opening, the live round they said that was in that gun belt, it's the same color. And you're going to be able to put that together as the evidence comes through. It's the same color as the rounds that Seth had that were blued. You're also going to hear that, that the sheriff's investigation, they never took Seth Kenny's fingerprints. And they never took his DNA. They didn't take his cell phone. So again, we're going to be missing evidence. Knowing that Seth Kenny was the primary ammunition supplier, knowing that he and Sarah Zachary had talked right after the shooting, Sarah had thrown rounds away, Sarah had moved stuff from the prop truck, none of Seth Kenny's phone, fingerprints, or DNA were taken. And you're also going to hear that there was no request to the FBI to check those live rounds for fingerprints or DNA. None. So the FBI lab was requested to do a bunch of forensic tests. They were testing the, the firearm Mr. Baldwin used to see if it functioned correctly. 
You're going to hear about other tests they did, but no testing on the live rounds. Zero. Again, that's going to be evidence that you are never going to see or have because the government didn't do it. And again, we have a reasonable doubt standard. Our expert, Mr. Kuski, is going to talk about the government's theory, state's theory, about these colors and, and the rounds. And I talked about that earlier briefly, but I'm just going to say it again because it's so important. You cannot tell a live round from a dummy by a picture. And the reason for that is that the dummies are made in Hollywood to look just like live rounds. Now, that the point of that is the people watching the movie don't know that it's not that it's, that it's a dummy. They're made to look just like a live round. Now, the picture Council for the State showed earlier showed a, a hole in that round. That is how they make some of the dummies. It's not how they make all the dummies. Some of the dummies, unfortunately, do not shake and they do not have a hole in them. And you're going to hear that one of those rounds was on this set. It's going to be in the CSI Tech, uh, Ms. Ms. Popple. It's in her report. Uh, it's called a Denix round from Spain. That round did not shake. So that's a dummy that looks like a live round and it does not shake with the BB, so you can tell. Mr. Kuski is going to talk about how this is highly dangerous and how Ms. Gutierrez Reed was faced with the situation on this set of dealing with a mixed match of dummies, cheap dummies, he's going to call it garbage, that were just thrown together that she had to deal with. Again, while OSHA is going to tell you she's being rushed, she's having to perform two jobs, she's asking for more resources and help from her manager, and she's not getting it. Third, you're going to hear that David Halls, the first assistant director, that he's going to say Ms. Gutierrez-Reed was doing a good job. Now he's going to, and she did good with safety on set. He was the first assistant director. He was the one that took the firearm and handed it to Baldwin. You're going to hear testimony that he never should have had that firearm, never. You're going to hear from a director, P.J. Pesh, who's done movies for over 30 years. P.J. Pesh uh, has done, all, you're going to hear about all his credits. He's worked on all kinds of movies. He's going to tell you that, that he's never seen a first assistant director in all those movies ever handle a weapon and hand it to the actor. This was a highly, highly unusual setup and management created by production. That was their fault. And what they've tried to do, and what you're seeing in this courtroom today, is trying to blame it all on Hannah, the 24-year-old, because why? Because she's an easy target. She's the least powerful person on that set. So what do we do? And you're going to see the evidence. They target her. You're also going to hear that David Halls he did not address prior safety issues. And this is part of the thing that OSHA found. David Halls, there were two accidental or negligent discharges on set. And what that is, is Sarah Zachary had one of them, and a stunt double for Baldwin had another one. What those are, you have a firearm with a blank in it, and you don't either uh, decock it, it's called, where you put the hammer down slowly so it doesn't fire, you don't do that right, and then it goes off unexpectedly. Uh, Sarah Zachary did that. The second one you're going to hear, a stunt double had a misfire, and these were on the same day, five days before the shooting, October 16th, the same day within an hour apart. Ms. Gutierrez really addressed it by talking about them because these are safety incidents. You can't have misfires like this, uh, negligent discharges like this. People are walking around, they don't have air protection. These blanks can actually fire off stuff out of up smoke and everything. That can, uh, it's dangerous. So David Halls did not do anything about it. Again, that's his job. 
you're going to hear that he was the security coordinator for the entire set. But David Halls didn't delay. He didn't order additional training. You're going to hear some of the head people, if you hear from them in this trial, for Russ Production, some of the head guys, they didn't even know about it. So they weren't informed about it. That's how much the production cared about safety. Because you know what the primary thing was here? It was Rush, get this done so we can get the money. And that's all on production. And Mr. Baldwin is one of the primary producers. That's on them. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed had no control over that. Finally, you're going to hear from OSHA that Russ Production didn't adhere to several safety rules that they have to adhere to on set. That's why they were fined. They gave them the largest fine in the history of New Mexico over this case because of what they did. You're going to hear that they didn't have a procedure to ensure live rounds were not brought into set. Nor did they give Ms. Zachary or Ms. Gutierrez-Reed enough time to thoroughly inventory. You're going to hear that Halls did not conduct daily safety meetings, and there was no safety instruction prior to Baldwin using the gun in the church. You're going to hear that Russ failed to accord Ms. Gutierrez-Reed more training days, and she was not able to train Baldwin on the cross draw. And you're going to hear again that Mr. Baldwin one of the lead producers, head actor in the movie, who really controlled the set, you're going to hear that he violated some of the most basic gun safety rules you can ever learn. From a young age, we all learn you don't point a gun at somebody, ever, unless you want to shoot them. You treat all guns as loaded, and you keep your finger out of the trigger until you're ready to shoot. He violated all of those. It wasn't Ms. Gutierrez Reed, that was Mr. Baldwin. Now you're going to hear from some other witnesses. There's going to be a lot of them, but the core principles at the end are you're going to be missing critical evidence. You're going to not hear about Seth Kenny because the government didn't investigate him. They chose not to. Mr. Kenny, primary ammo supplier, Talking with Sarah Zachary, she's throwing stuff away. They didn't go after him. They went after Miss Gutierrez Reed. And you can think about that. Why would they do that? Miss Gutierrez Reed did the best job she could under very, very tough circumstances, trying to get into this profession, a profession she really wanted to do. She was trained by her dad, a longtime armor. 24 years old. She had insufficient time to do her armor duties because she was also forced to do props. And management made a number of mistakes and did not create the proper atmosphere. Rust production in the state want to scapegoat her. She is not guilty of the crimes charged against her. And the, the prosecution must prove that beyond a reasonable doubt and I submit they will not in this trial for the reasons I've stated and the evidence that you will see. All right, thank you. As requested by the <coughs> council on directing any, any uh, uh, 